So our first speaker this afternoon uh, is Frank Schirmeister from Cadence Design Systems. He's the uh, Senior Group Director of Product Management. Uh, he's a C um, and marketing for emulation, FPGA based and virtual proto prototyping, hardware software enablement uh, as part of the Cadence verification suite. I will hand over to Frank now. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. Um, welcome. So we are about halfway done after lunch, so it's probably a good, good time for a brief stretch just to understand the audience. Who was here last year and saw Mike Stelfox, my colleague, presenting last year? Hands up. Oh, that's actually a lot of people who weren't there. So everybody who didn't raise their hands, stand up and we do a brief, brief after lunch stretch. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Okay. It doesn't work in Britain. It doesn't work in Britain. What I was planning to do, oh, my friend from Gross here helped me. What I was planning to do is take a picture and then tweet right away, standing ovation at Verification Futures. But, <laughs> okay, humor isn't quite gone. So, very good. So, um, I hope lunch was great. I meant a note to myself, don't go on conference calls while lunch is ongoing. Um, what I'll try to do over the next 30 minutes or so um, and I have this agreement with uh, Sarah who does, thanks to Sarah, she does an excellent um, uh, job in getting us presenters, keeping us presenters on time. So I'm starting three minutes late, um, so I'm, um, uh, I, will have, I will end two minutes late. What I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about verification throughput and uh, in order to um, get this uh, bingo card full, uh, when we created the title a while, a while back, I put a couple of key keywords in there. So 5G, machine learning, AI, so that everybody um, uh, spends attention or, or gives attention to the presentation. But I will actually go into the 5G aspects in a little bit more detail. Just to date myself, I'm born about a couple of years after that, almost 10 years after that, and it's quite amazing where we have become, where we have gotten from this um, early on, just uh, transistors and so forth, to now really opportunities which are in EDA quite significant, enabling with parallel full flow solutions, deep learning, enabling edge to cloud uh, things, specialized chips, enabling artificial intelligence. So it is quite uh, impressive how far we've come in uh, um, almost 60 years. I'm not there yet, so I'm, as I said, I'm below that, uh, insist on that. This is what Cadence is evolving into. The reason why I was showing this first slide is this is um, um, everything that's happening right now on the consumer world or in the user world enabled by EDA. Cadence as an EDA player, as many other companies, in the space is evolving fast. While we have this core piece here of verification, the digital flow with synthesis to implementation, the analog RF and also IP, we are growing up, and this is our keyword here, our key strategy, intelligent system design. We are growing up towards things like system analysis. We are going up to deal with embedded software. It's really not the chip anymore which I myself, uh, my last uh, chip tape out was like in 97 or something like that. This has quite tremendously improved since then. And EDA is now enabling machine learning, using machine learning um, to make things across all those, product, all those application domains much more productive. So it's all about the data, um, which is kind of funnily broken over here. Um, in this version of how the slides are spread. It's about all data being um, collected with sensors, transmitted to uh, infrastructure like 5G and the wireless infra the wired infrastructure, to data centers for compute, and then you have lots of storage. This is driving this, the wheel here of invention from our perspective in this, what Le Tan, our CEO, calls a data-driven world. And you have very significant challenges in here which influence verification. You have um, workloads which become very specific in this new world. You don't have just purely x86 execution anymore or ARM-based execution. The workloads become specialized. You have to deal with connectivity um, between the clusters and the scaling out of clusters. In the case of AI, 
which is computing all the data you have here in the data center. You have different types of chips. We saw GraphCore this morning um, with their chip and some of the requirements um, uh, they have. I did put my application in already for given that there was a lot of hiring demand. Um, so we have um, requests here or uh, requirements on training, very high throughput for big designs. So if uh, we are working, this is publicly known very closely with the likes of NVIDIA. So there's um, very high throughput, lots of verification cycles necessary, just like Mark from Infineon showed as well where this verification challenge comes with lots of cycles. Even in the inferencing, which is smaller, that's what I have in my cell phone, um, and apparently Harry has it in his uh, watch as well, when Siri um, um, picks him up there. That's the inferencing, the, that needs flexibility of design. Very specific IP is re required in this context, so EDA has taken on some of the IP components, like in our case, Tensilica, and that causes really key challenges, those development needs, from throughput to virtually special memory interfaces. I was in the session here earlier on software, the whole use case development, like the test software testing, and you need the right um, verification infrastructure, verification IP, and so forth around it. So let's talk 5G for three minutes. When I first saw this thing, somebody asked me, well, do you know the 5G triangle? And I'm like, well, Googled it like everybody else. And I looked it up from a requirements perspective, and, and since then I have dug a little bit deeper, it tries to combine in 5G very, very low latency, millisecond latency, for a million devices per square, square kilometer. So that's kind of, somebody up front here was complaining it's 160 people in such a small room. Of course, wireless is slow. Well, um, try Wembley, right? So that will make this a little bit more uh, challenging than we have it here. At the highest data rates you need for mobile broadband. So how do we do this? This is what we have today. We have our devices, my phone, Harry's uh, Apple Watch, um, my colleague's car, we just had a conference call in, connected to the standard um, environment, the standard wired infrastructure we have today. Every two to three kilometers, since I've been looking at this in a bit more detail, they peep, keep uh, popping up everywhere on my way to work in Silicon Valley. Um, I just didn't notice them before. So what is happening with this in 5G? We are adding lots of lots of smaller cells every 200 meter. We are adding femto cells in buildings. We are um, adding the, uh, for the houses, for our urban environment. We are adding fixed wireless, replacing copper, the uh, re replacing cable um, to the end house, to the end consumer. All this is happening in the millimeter wave spectrum and it's connected through this optical front hall, which connects to the internet backbone back here with the longer latency and longer distance pieces. And then in between we have now my um, bullshit bingo, pardon my French, is complete. I mentioned edge computing as well. Edge computing is really the piece which um, allows us to deal with the very low latency aspects we need when it comes to, for example, industrial pieces where in an industrial production scenario, I can't afford to go all the way back to the backbone and control it all from here. So completely new subsystem requirements, completely new bandwidth in the system, um, lots of opportunity for us as US users and EDA providers helping to enable you to build this infrastructure and then do the right things with it. So what do we do with those? What are some of the aspects for 5G and what verification requirements do they create? So enhanced mobile broadband, that's when my daughter says it takes too long in the car to download an episode of a Netflix show, which is at 4G speeds, LTE speeds for 150 megabytes, about 13 minutes. So 5G has a promise to get this down to under a minute. So you have very fast speed, low latency. You have in those environments, um, high definition video, virtual reality. I liked uh, graph course, cool um, graphics there of, um, with the almost biological looking um, neural networks. Typically very large designs, 
200 goes um, larger than 200 million gates you will have to execute the full chip simulate the full chip mark from infineon had interesting requirements there the long cycle emulation he had as a last um, requirement in his list is uh, playing right into this you need this for the full chip this is the the very large designs which are often used as trailblazers in eda the second thing are the Internet of Things thing. So that's Harry's um, uh, Siri. This is my fit little tracker here. We have for work how many steps um, I'm, I'm going per day. Um, this is um, using the existing networks, but you have new connections all at once, lots of more connections all at once. Um, it, there's competition here a little bit with Wi-Fi and Zigbee. It's not the biggest of designs, so the revenue for those is actually not all that big. So they're very small designs, but they're very power sensitive. So flows for low power become very, very important. And you need to uh, understand the full system, um, the, the notion of how does my component actually perform within the system. Two more other things in, in 5G, which are kind of very obvious right now, things we see our customer base working on in the area of mission critical and control domains. When I look at things like um, the medical piece, uh, we're working a lot with air and defense um, companies, automotive companies, of course. Latency has been limiting. 5G gives um, an option there that I'm actually now, when I really get, at least in my local environment, to the edge, when I get to the millisecond latencies, I can move control and compute from my end device, make it cheaper, and move it uh, to the edge and uh, from there into the cloud. That gives you um, small and medium designs, but then you need to do things like functional safety. Again, Mark from Infineon, I don't see him. He had, oh, there you are. The functional safety piece, you mentioned this as the first point in your list, so I do listen. I, I followed as an EDA vendor your inputs, and we need to talk about the, the emulation coverage thing because I think we may be farther there than you think, so this may be an update um, we can we can talk about, but the functional safety here for those mission critical pieces and auto pieces makes, uh, adds more requirements to EDA. Mark had a really cool chart there where he added these as, as complexity pieces. Last not least, fixed access that I now have in my house, no cables come, but all coming, uh, giving me wired broadband. That's again um, the extension of the traditional base station. It's uh, very large designs again. So things like emulation and complexity play a role. So that's why this is a market slide I wanted to end this section with. That's why if you look, this is going back quite some time because I wanted to put the 2008 downturn in here. When you look at uh, into the design starts based on the IBS data here, the real growth in design starts is really in the small designs, 45 nanometer and below. But the thing which is really important, you have this bifurcation. For all these other designs, this is actually a constant factor. I still need to do, uh, need to deal with the less complex, uh, um, uh, the guy who is on a seven nanometer design looks at these as, oh yeah, those are easy. Well, they're not that easy when it comes to analog mixed signals, they still need to be developed. So you have this bifurcation of design starts that both very large designs and smaller designs need to be dealt with. So what's the unifying challenge in all this? This, is with, this comes down to the um, verification and software. So this is actually, um, I'm, I'm quoting Harry here. We had some trans uh, translation issues here. But this is essentially the implementation of the chip itself. So that's RTL down. This um, light green is verification. And then the dark green is software. So you have a verification need. You have a software need. And that's really going almost exponentially. So software and the, the verification of the chip and the subsystem becomes the unifying challenge here. So it's all a race. How do we, how do we be faster? The colleague from GraphCore was pointing it out. How do I get fast enough to my chip? And, and the Infineon presentation requirements were great as well with how fast do I get my chip out? Well, you need three components. You need it to be fast. All performance is important. And yeah, this guy has not been tested by what we heard from Mira this morning uh, with the test environments. Um, uh, but the, it visualizes nicely the raw performance need. 
you need to be um, able to put multiple different engines together. This came also out uh, from Infineon and uh, putting the different pieces together. So my next destination happens to be Paris and I have uh, various options from flying through car, walk, train. I end up, uh, I will end up uh, using the, the Eurostar. So I'll be somewhere underneath here. But the key point is there is no one engine with which you can do everything efficiently and it depends on the context, right? So depending what time of the day I'm at, train may be better than car to get into London tonight and things like that. And then the third thing is what we, what in the transportation domain you would call smart logistics. So you need to now be very dependent on when, which time of the day do I have, how do I can combine my engines, how can I be smart about my usage. So how does it translate to verification? The way we look at it when kind of trying to put together all our customer requirements we hear day in day out when we um, when we talk to them the 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 key part is software development the early software development and enablement and in that context with verification and software being the key driver being the number one in verification throughput is our objective so how do you do that you build engines which give you the right performance so you need fast bare metal compute it needs to be scalable to big designs optimized for performance you need to be able to efficiently put those engines together that's what we refer to as multi-level abstraction and that gives you the cycles per day the cost per day it was interesting how graph course said earlier that um we're, yeah getting another million in terms of um, uh, machine investment is an easy sell to save the big program uh, that's essentially where all this here plays uh, being very smart about combining the engines and having the right bare metal compute so we are doing our part on this from an EDA perspective and then on top of it you have what we refer to as smart bug hunting which is the um, combination of having the right verification IP available coverage and metrics as pointed out by Infineon, debug, formal techniques, Harry did great as always on the, the formal um, the, the description here. And then we haven't talked too much about yet about this portable stimulus. There will be more to come right after me about efficient test generation. So let's go through them real brief for the next couple of minutes. On the raw performance side, you have the situation that you have simulation which has great debug flexibility and insight and it's not fast enough for a lot of the cases right so what's referred to earlier as commodity so you need to do emulation you need to do prototyping to get performance and you really have this cycle you need to go back and forth with them that's why unified flow is very important if you look into the simulation side Throughput for simulation really means compile the design as fast as possible. We have been working on things like incremental build, parallel builds, which gives you up to 10 times speed up. And then there's this notion in a lot of EDA that parallelism is the universal answer to everything. In simulation, it actually is a partial answer. You need the incremental build, um, you need the, the uh, multi-core technology where you distribute across multiple cores in your design, which we see typically up to four times speed up for long tests, but you also need a very efficient single core kernel. That's why we are focusing on both items together. And then very important, you need to be able to use the right engines underneath to run it. ARM-based servers are something which is complementing x86-based servers in the data center now quite nicely. It's all in the cloud. Uh, they have distinctive advantages here amongst them. So having these tools available like our Excelium, our simulator on the different engines is very important. And what you do with that then is you look at, for example, your regression profile. You have a couple of outliers. You take these outliers which take too long for your regression suite, parallelize them on multiple cores. Uh, with multiple cores uh, you get uh, three times faster simulation in this case using eight cores, which basically reigns in the overall um, regression time. So that's simulation. 
emulation and FPGA-based prototyping, what's this whole processor-based versus FPGA-based um, uh, emulation about? We tried to put together a slide which explains easily why you need both. Our strategy is you need processor-based emulation with our own processor for fast bring up and debug. You also need FPGA-based prototyping for speed and cost. Why is that? Well, we need to do this verification productivity loop to do compile, find the right spot to execute it, run it, and then debug it. That happens thousands of thousands of times during a verification flow. So if you look at FPGA and processor-based simulation, if you take your logic, the digital logic in this case, there are really very fundamental different ways of mapping it. If you map it into um, our custom emulation processor here, you have a simple left to right stream processing mapping all this logic in here. You are limited in speed because there's a lot of time multiplexing goes, uh, going on here, but you have fast, predictable compile and great debug. Well, if you go into FPGA and we think really you need both, you actually have an ASIC style full place and route. You always have to close timing, so if your timing doesn't close, if you violate timing rules there, you go back to start and don't collect 200 bucks like in Monopoly, right? So it's also limited in debug, but once you have optimized it, it gets you high speed. So the key core use models are hardware debug and software bring up for those two engines. And what we do, we really um, put forward a flow taking the same RTL and have a unified flow between the two engines, emulation and prototyping so that you can move to here for speed and software development and go back here to emulation with for debug and the rich use models. We see our customers doing this, depending on the application domain, they may use more of the uh, debug loaded hardware uh, centric emulation or in something areas like networking storage, we have seen lots of regressions and software running on FPGA so depending on the application domain, that's just different. Here's a great example very recently, just a couple of months old from Toshiba uh, in the, the SSD domain, where they use both together and you see they ramp, ramp up first with emulation, then they enable the uh, firmware team with emulation. Then at one point, the ASIC teams um, um, use the emulation for regressions mostly and firmware development continues on FPGA. So I put the link in here. Um, I invite you to, to go and check the full presentation out. But the key part here is you get the faster speed and the debug efficiency and bring up together with the unified flow. In the space of hardware-assisted verification, where it's often about hardware verification to software development and then in between regressions, if you look that over that in capacity, up to now, we actually had this missing spot here that if you had very large designs and you wanted to do software development on them, you needed to cut them down quite significantly. So for that, we just introduced recently a new system, which is a rack-based FPGA-based system, also congruent with emulation, has high performance and packs multiple users into it. So that's the uh, scalable performance, the uh, performance, the raw performance, the little car I had earlier, it scales to FPGA large designs and uh, large emulation designs as well. The second piece, now how do I, how do I put these together? Um, I get software, RTL gate, transistor all packed together. There are lots of different requirements users care about from when can I get it, speed, accuracy, capacity, it would be nice to have one engine who can do it all. I'm German, as my accent will give away. In Germany, we actually have that. That's guy, that's called, that guy's called the Eierlegende Wollmilchsau. It's an animal, perfect wall animal. It's laying eggs, producing wool, giving out milk, can be turned into bacon. Well, it would be nice. It doesn't really exist when we look into the hardware development, the, the development spaces. You have HDL simulation at, in the smaller range of, of um, speed,
but um, it's uh, very limited for software debug all the way to FPGA being fast, but later in the flow and uh, being limited in debug. So what do you do? You combine these in a flow, right? This is your project flow. You find bugs over time. You use different engines over time and you combine the engines, the virtual model and the RTL model together to find the most efficient one I'll skip over this slide, which uh, gives you which gives you the ability to um, then bring together IP verification with software or full SOC verification with software. Given that I just got two minutes back versus what I had planned, I go back to the slide. You have full silicon here, all virtual here, various combinations of virtual and um, uh, meaning TLM based, system C based typically environment for software combined with either IP for verifying this IP or bringing up a full chip in a mixed form. But then at the end, you'll always run the full RTL and bring up your software. What do we do in this domain? Um, you need a platform creation environment with libraries, uh, modeling automation to create your platform. Then you need to be able to give it to your software developers with a runtime environment connected to debuggers and then um, go uh, connected to the implementation world. So that's something we do at Cadence. Our colleagues from uh, Mentor and uh, Synopsys also have that. What you then do with that, you have your SOC with software and you run this early in your design flow. Uh, through the flow to get as many hardware software bugs out of the system. So this one I really had planned to go very fast over. Uh, there's not enough time to really have all portions described in as much detail, but you need verification IP, you need the right protocols to uh, verify your items. We have uh, items here in our environment. We work also with partners on that. You need this portable stimulus piece, the next presentation from Brecker, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the day in more detail as well. So we support the standards here. I'll not go into full detail on that today. You need verification management. So you wanna take your requirements and go through this loop of testing. And then you need debug to do hardware and software debug together. And at the end, Harry talked very eloquently this morning about formal. Uh, we just, uh, in this domain, added more um, technology using machine learning in formal to help you to with staging get um, the, the, the formal coverage up very early. So those are the four, five items, verification IP, portable stimulus, verification management, debug, and formal. So to sum it up, just in the last two minutes here, two, three minutes, what's next after here? Well, you have this verification throughput piece a lot of this relates to machine learning. We have machine learning in our tools. We deal with things like regressions, formal just announced um, using machine learning to optimize uh, the process of formal verification. We are enabling chips with that and we are, they're really completely new flows in the works here. That's what we refer to as ML outside, machine learning outside where we are automating design flows. And the next big things to look out for from my perspective, and I saw it on the slides from our colleagues from Mentor as well, is this thing called the digital twin. And this goes back again to the presentation this morning where the question was, how do we actually verify AI, right? Digital twin in principle is not that magic. You extend from the silicon all the way up to the system, combining multiple systems together. but. You, there are completely new challenges ahead of us, which the colleague this morning already mentioned. How to actually verify the ML AI design, how to verify that the neural network I just programmed doesn't only execute correctly, but that's what I really want to do and doesn't go rogue like these two here um, by doing things which your um, AI ML was not supposed to do. That's a complete new set of challenges we has, as an industry have to deal with. So I don't have an answer for that, even though it was on the challenge list this morning, but I can tell you we are working on it. So if you're interested in what we're doing in that domain, we're happy to talk about it. We can't do it alone. We work with partners like Greenhills, 
We part, uh, work with partners like National Instruments, Ultrasoc here from the UK. As one vendor, you really need an ecosystem to do all this together, security here with Tortuga. So we're working with a lot of partners on this together. And that gives you at the end this, what we call the verification suite. It's good to be in verification these days. We have lots of growth here, lots of, uh, lots of new uh, companies adopting it. And uh, with that, we are enabling what Cadence calls intelligent system design. We are down here, this piece, and there are much more uh, components and partnerships in the works on that. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much.